Uh, and basically, I have 15 minutes to give you an overview of uh, sort of ethical issues arising with algorithms, or what I like to call the topic of algorithmic accountability. So please forgive my uh, brevity and some of the, the shallowness of the coverage, um, but this is very much a, an overview, both of what we know in terms of uh, ethical issues arising from the use of algorithms, but then also regulatory responses to them, sort of general principles we're seeing in terms of regulation um, and the types of protections, I suppose, um, that you can have as a result. So the overview is based on a paper uh, that I did with uh, Patrick Allo, Rosario Tadeo, Sandra Vachter, and Luciano Floridi um, at the Oxford Internet Institute. And it's essentially a review of academic literature uh, discussing ethical issues with algorithms. Um, and the, before I go into what I think the issues are, um, I'm a philosopher by background, so I have to define my terms before I talk about them. Um, primarily because the term algorithm is used in such a way now where it can mean almost anything. It can mean basically any sufficiently complex technology, things that we find confusing or in some way challenging. Um, and so what I'm interested in is what I would call a decision-making algorithm. So it's an algorithm that's going to process data in, in some way and produce a recommendation. could just be the correct way to uh, interpret the input data. It could be recommendation for some action to take uh, with you know, a person who's represented by the data. Um, but it's going to be something that in some way confounds human abilities for comprehension, both in terms of the number of dimensions that we can keep in mind when we're making a decision, and just in terms of the overall amount of data um, that we can consider ourselves. And so I'm not talking about mundane algorithms. I'm not talking about the type of algorithm that would automate a factory line. I'm talking about something more complex than that. Um, and there's at least three different levels that you can talk about these decision-making algorithms. One would be at the very highest, most abstract level in terms of the mathematical construct. Uh, the next would be its implementation within a particular software system or, or technology, um, so once it's actually coded. And finally, the configuration of that technology or software package to tackle a particular problem, to process particular um, data, uh, basically its configuration for different uses. So the primary, um, primary contribution of the paper was this typology of the types of concerns or characteristics with um, decision-making algorithms. So just to run you through these quickly, to start out, you can have at least three different types of epistemic concerns with these sorts of algorithms. So you can be, you can be concerned that the evidence that you're producing is inconclusive in the, essentially the correlation versus causation problem. You're producing probabilistic, uncertain knowledge that you have to choose to act on. You can also be concerned that the, the process of producing that evidence is in some way inscrutable. This is essentially the opacity, interpretability, complexity problem. But this can also be a case of not knowing what input data is actually going into, uh, into the system. And even if you're happy on those two counts, you can also be concerned um, that the evidence might be in some way misguided. Um, so this can be a result of biased data, biased input data, biased training data, non-representative uh, input data. Um, there's a good example of sort of how that can happen unexpectedly from Boston. So Boston had um, the, the Street Bump app, which was essentially an app for smartphones that would detect potholes in roads. Um, and so they deployed that, and what happened was potholes were being fixed much quicker in more affluent areas of Boston. Simple reason being the people that could afford um, the, the smartphones, or at the very least the ones that were motivated to install the app, um, lived within these areas. It's a foreseeable problem, but not something that was actually foreseen uh, by the, the developers of the app and the city council that chose to use it. So even if you're happy on all three of those accounts, even if you think that your evidence is conclusive, that it's scrutable or well, is, can be investigated, even if you're happy it's not biased, that it's representative, you can still be concerned about the fairness of the outcomes produced by the algorithm, so the fairness of the actions. Um, you can also be concerned about transformative effects of these systems. So this can be as something as simple as just the way that we talk about machine learning, the way we talk about algorithms. We refer to them as intelligent. We're attaching certain values to, uh, to these systems by calling them that. Or it can be just the more you know, larger societal organizational effects 
of having sort of more and more data-driven understanding about people. We start to understand people more in terms of correlations, how we can relate them to other people uh, through the data that they produce. That's a transformative effect of these types of systems. And so even if you're sort of happy on all those accounts, um, you can still be concerned about the traceability. This is sort of an overarching concern. Essentially, how do you actually trace who is responsible for the actions of the system? Is it the system itself? Is it the developers, the configurers, the people using the system? Um, and then how do you actually distribute responsibility across that network of actors? So from those types of concerns, um, we were able to map seven different types of challenges that are discussed in the literature. Quite often this will be a one-to-one -one mapping, but the language here might be uh, more familiar in terms of how we talk about the problems uh, raised by algorithms. In some cases, there, there's more than one, for example, in terms of transformative effects. Um, and then besides those, we can also find some gaps uh, in the literature. So one gap that um, is quite important that I'll be talking about a little bit is in terms of group effects, group privacy, the fact that we make sense of people through their connections to other people now rather than as unique identifiable individuals. Um, also the distribution of responsibility across the network as I suggested. Um, De-responsibilization, so basically the phenomenon when people start to work with uh, recommendation systems more, that they can start to trust the recommendation system by default and not uh, question it or at least not take responsibility for uh, acting on the recommendation. And so I'm going to cover a couple of these in more detail uh, before, very quickly before uh, talking a bit about the regulatory uh, environment that we have at the moment. I'm almost halfway done now. So um, to start with the problem of unjustified actions, um, this goes back to at least Richard Feynman, his, his piece on cargo cult science. Um, but the question is essentially, when is a correlation sufficiently reliable to be acted upon? So what we're discovering is not truth, but rather actionable insights. Insights that we think are sufficiently reliable that we say, okay, I'm happy to act on that. I'm happy to take an action that will have an effect on a person um, based on this correlation. And of course the question is, well, what are the risks of being wrong? The risks will be very different in different contexts. What are the standards of releasing tools or results or at, again acting upon these correlations. So we just had a great example of why we need these sorts of standards, why we need sort of new research ethical standards um, for essentially acting upon correlations. The Stanford uh, facial recognition story, which I'm sure uh, everybody came across, essentially the prediction of sexual orientation based on somebody's face um, that have, they have been roundly criticized for. Uh, Kate Crawford called it uh, algorithmic phrenology, I think, quite a, a damning indictment. But I think that there is a, a, a fundamental problem there that has existed since we've started studying the internet in general and doing studies with what we call public data. The other question is, so when is an opaque automated decision actually sufficiently reliable? What are our expectations in terms of the explainability of a decision before we're happy to act upon it? And it may be that we want to limit the usage of particularly opaque systems in certain contexts. So in high risk contexts, for example. So um, examples would be for credit ratings, for health insurance, uh, for medical decision making. In the US, they actually have a requirement um, under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. I think I'm getting these names right. Fair Credit Reporting Act and Equal Credit Opportunity Act that basically requires um, uh, data controllers to give some sort of explanation to people that receive an adverse decision, for example, when they're applying for a loan. Now there's been an, the emergence of a sort of industry standard set of reasons that you can give somebody. It's a list of, I think, 20 or so reasons and you just tick off the reasons and then give that to the person who has been adversely affected. But as a result of that, they need to use systems that are in some way human interpretable. They need to be able to fill out that checklist. Um, and so that has prevented uh, the, the use of more, uh, more opaque, more highly complex, you know, highly complex machine learning methods in the past at least. What they're doing now um, may be a different story. Um, so as, as I was just uh, sort of talking about a bit, uh, opacity is obviously a, a huge problem. I put this up. I put this slide up not because I don't think people know what opacity is, but rather to just highlight that it's more than just the interpretability problem. It's more than just 
not being able to understand how the system is learning and making decisions. It's also an issue of accessibility to systems, accessibility to the decisions they're making, to the, the input data that they're using. And accessibility may be blocked in terms of uh, due to trade secrets, wanting to protect proprietary uh, software or proprietary information, the willingness of the data controller, uh, whether public or private sector, to give you that sort of access. There may be technical barriers, of course, to explaining uh, the system. And also, there's an issue of scale, um, that you know, even if you do have access to a system, the sort of exponential growth of data and systems to make sense of it means that at least individuals have a very difficult challenge in terms of controlling uh, data about them, having oversight over how the data is being used. And then finally, also, um, there's the issue of data provenance, which is sometimes ignored. It's essentially the assumptions that go into collecting data, wrangling it, cleaning it, how is it collected, what are its biases and, and limitations. And there's a great paper from 2016 by Jenna Burrell that basically introduces the problem of opacity and machine learning in a very, very accessible way. Um, I'd highly recommend it if, if you're interested. And so just to sort of get, uh, to drive home the scale issue, this is a map from the data map project out of Harvard showing all the different places that a uh, patient's data in America can go to, the different types of uses it can be put to, or the different types of data controllers um, it can end up going to. And this is just, you know, in one context, imagine the individual actually trying to have meaningful oversight over that. Um, another issue, of course, is autonomy and unpredictability. We had a great example when Microsoft released the Tay Ch chatbot on Twitter that quickly learned to be very racist, misogynistic, because it was trained in the wild by uh, internet users, essentially. And it just points towards the unpredictability, the risks of actually releasing a system to be trained by the public or to be trained by a particular sector of the public. We're highly unpredictable. We don't all have altruistic motivations. And so actually predicting the, how a system will learn and how the, the biases, the prejudices of the people training it will then be reproduced is a very, very difficult uh, task. Another issue has to do with the privacy of groups I alluded to a little bit before. Essentially, the way that we protect people currently is through individual privacy protections. Data protection law essentially doesn't um, do much for, for groups of individuals, but rather is concerned about the identifiable individual. We protect people's uh, privacy through hiding their identity in a data set, through individual consent user agreements, through individual control over, or, over data. But the problem is, uh, on the one hand, you're not a person in the absence of identifiability in the eyes of the law. Um, there are one or two exceptions to that, but this, that's sort of the, the general approach. And that's a real problem because the way that we make sense of people now is through patterns uh, connecting them. We search for similarities, for small patterns between people that we find meaningful. And essentially what that means is your identity ends up being shared with other people. You have this form of group identity that is something new that I think needs to be protected in addition to individual privacy rights. So it's essentially calling for a group privacy right um, for, for these ad hoc groups, these algorithmically assembled groups. Um, and then f final issue you have a problem of how you actually assign blame and praise for the, the uh, actions of, of these systems, but I'm going to skip over this just in uh, the interest of time. And so just to quickly turn to the regulatory side, so generally we have at least three expectations of systems reflected in policy proposals, that they're fair, that they're accountable, that they're transparent. Um, this is very much reflected in the EU General Data Protection Regulation, the proposal for civil law rules on robotics. Um, and in terms of how those actually get translated into things, one idea was um, to give people right to explanation, to go and demand an explanation from data controllers when a decision is made about you by an algorithm. Um, unfortunately, we don't have that right. We have sort of a right to be informed, something that's much more limited, that just tells you a bit about the general functionality of the system, um, so its general design, maybe what types of data it's considering, but not much else. Um, so that was, that's sort of how we're approaching transparency in terms of the, the GDPR. Um, there are huge limitations on the other provisions in the GDPR that would apply to algorithms to AI. Um, it only applies to solely automated processes. So literally, if you have a human nominally involved in the decision-making process, I really do mean nominally, then all the safeguards you get uh, in the law against automated decision-making don't apply. It's a huge gap. And also, the system has to have legal and significant uh, 
um, effects. And just finally, the other approach that we can have is to basically treat these sorts of systems as black boxes. Um, look only at the inputs and outputs of the system. Don't actually try to explain the rationale, the decision-making process of the system. Similar to when you buy a car, you know that there's regulations uh, governing its design, its manufacture, safety regulations. You can also tell when it's broken down. You may not know why it's broken down or how to fix it, but you can at least tell it's broken. And so to transfer that to algorithms, we could at least tell when they're being discriminatory. We could at least tell at a system level when they're being unfair. I think we need something similar to that. And so just two questions I'm hoping can be included in the, the discussion at the end of the session. I'm curious about, so we have methods uh, being developed for detecting fairness, uh, bias, discrimination in the inputs and outputs of these sorts of systems. I'm wondering to what extent are they actually scalable? And to what extent do you actually find them relevant to your work? Is this something that you could incorporate in your work? And also, how could you actually put pressure on the private sector to incorporate these things uh, themselves? So thank you very much. Thank you, Brent.